This podcast is recorded on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. We extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples listening today. Hello and welcome to Give and Tote Cannabis Conversations, the show that aims to elevate the conversation about cannabis to a higher level. I'm your host, Paul, and today we welcome Dr. Maddie Moore, Cannabis Prescribing General Practitioner from Mode Healthcare in Dunsborough, WA. In this episode, we're going to discuss all sorts of awesome things. Maddie is so passionate, so enthusiastic, and it's great to hear from someone who's a legit GP, a real doctor that can tell my mum that this stuff is okay. If you like what you hear, make sure you follow us on your podcast platform of choice and on Instagram at Give and Toke. For now, please enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to Give and Tote Cannabis Conversations. Today I am joined by Dr. Maddie Moore, cannabis prescribing GP authorized by the Therapeutic Goods Association, born and raised in Austin, Texas, a graduate of Baylor and Ross Universities, who after working in rural Wyoming, now calls Australia home. Welcome to the show, Dr. Matty Moore. Paul, thanks for having me. Excited to be here, buddy. It's so good to have you here today and to talk to somebody who is working in the Australian cannabis industry. This show is really about sharing stories and normalizing cannabis use, but through exceptional people, through people that are helping this industry, through people that have got interesting stories to tell. Now, you are working here in Australia, but you're born and bred in the USA. To a typical Aussie, when we hear Texas, we think kind of Republican, conservative. So what was it like being born and raised in Austin, Texas, which I know is a little bit more small owl liberal than the rest of Texas? It is. It is. It's the it's the liberal mecca of Texas. You know, it's, a, it's the, you know, the blue... Uh, center of a very red state um so blue and blue and red meaning you know democrat and republican so yeah it's it's a it's a really interesting place to grow up i mean it's super funky really fun really cool great food nightlife great outdoors um so yeah it was a wonderful place to grow up but very you know outside of austin it's pretty darn conservative so um you know, I think Texas is going to be one of those states that holds on to that conservative bias a lot longer than they should. So your time working as a GP in rural Wyoming seemed to kind of be the part of the catalyst for your work in cannabis. I know you've told your kind of origin story a million times before, but what was that turning point like? Yeah, look, I think I, I've always since since training, um, you know, when Colorado kind of kicked off it was something that i really observed and being a cannabis enthusiast you know really enjoyed seeing that change certainly for america and it was really interesting to see how it was done you know a few of my friends had cards I certainly had some doctor buddies in colorado who were you know prescribing and and so i certainly visited with them a lot and and got a, a sense of you know, how they did things. And and we quickly moved after, you know, I graduated for residency and then was in private practice for a year or two. And then we moved to Australia. So I didn't, didn't really have a chance to, to do it because, you know, Wyoming is still, um, you know, not a medicinal cannabis state and nor obviously nor is it recreational. So I, do, I didn't really have the opportunity to kind of delve into that side of medicine until I got to Australia. And, you know, we got here 2010, 2011, and, um, you know, of course, legalization for medicinal purposes here in 2016. So, um, you know, I was in the ED at the time, working some GP in Perth, and then we had moved down uh, down to Bunbury for a little bit and now down to Bustleton, Dunsborough area. So during that time, you know, GPs were allowed to prescribe, you know, without specialist support, which I think, you know, makes access a lot better for patients and Certainly, for point of contact, most you know most people know know their GP well, and so it was a good opportunity for me to to kind of start trickling patients and you know seeing how it went. And man, it just opened my eyes. It was so fun, so motivating to to help people in that way, give them an alternative. You know, certainly it's not for everybody. We've had patients that haven't really done well with it, or or it's just expensive. But it's been it's been awesome. So I. I I've really transitioned, you know, most of what I'm doing into my own practice and and providing plant medicine and and other therapies too. Or you know, our our ethos is really holistic 
and um, you know we're able to provide medicinal cannabis to patients all over Australia, which I, th- I think is a really neat thing. Anybody who is familiar with your work would know that you're incredibly passionate about the science behind cannabis, the evidence, the justification. And a lot of the time you speak, you obviously come from the point of view of a medical expert. But I'm curious because I think a lot of cannabis patients kind of have this prerequisite that the people they're dealing with need to use cannabis themselves. Do you have a personal relationship with cannabis? I do. I do have a personal relationship with cannabis. It's, it's, um, it's much better these days, you know, from, from when I was younger, um, not really respecting the medicine to where now I, I, uh, I certainly do. It's almost like a, you know, a spiritual religious relationship, to be honest, you know, from, for what it provides to me, because I've got, you know, I've got some neuropathic back pain, which is pretty significant at times and it can, it can floor me. Um, and I, I've used all the other, all, all the other medicines, you know, certainly, NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, uh, you know, way too much over the years, you know, probably if I'd have known what I know now, I probably wouldn't have, but you know, you have to do what you have to do. And so now I don't have to, you know, I'm, I'm using a, a CBD oil that's extremely helpful for uh, that irritation, that inflammation during the day, it doesn't dumb me down. And I also use, you know, cannabis flower um, and cannabis, uh, oil with THC at night sometimes to help me sleep because it can, I don't know if you've ever had back pain or significant pain, but it can really affect you. So I do have a relationship with cannabis and it's, it's a very respectful, mindful relationship now. And I think that's something that's incredibly important, especially as Australia moves from medical legalization to eventually recreational, or as I prefer to say, adult use cannabis down the line. Mm -hmm. It's definitely something that we need to encourage is that responsible use. And we see different perspectives on that. We see doctors that won't prescribe THC products to people that are under 23 or 25, for example. We have all different kind of uh, ranges of how that might work. What's your perspective on that? Well, I think certainly we have to be careful with THC, you know, in, in that um, developing brain, you know, that those neural pathways are important for an entire lifetime. And and we don't honestly, because of prohibition, we don't have that long-term data to know for a fact that, you know, that's not going to be prohibitive, uh, of them reaching their potential. So I think going about things safely and conservatively and, and really, um, mindfully, um, certainly careful with our, our patients that have sensitive systems like the geriatric population and, and pediatric population, those that are under 18 and, and certainly with developing brain and developing um, bodies continue to grow until age 23. So maybe that's why the, the um, threshold of 23 was chosen, but um, I can't fault them for that. You know, I think that's, that's fine, but also I would encourage those people to be bold because, you know, can- cannabis is a very, benign medication and those side effects do come with THC, but they're controllable. And, you know, as long as, um, you know, we're doing good follow-up, good communication with our patients, educating them, I I don't see the hassle whatsoever. I think it it can be a very useful tool in our our toolkit. Definitely really appreciate that explanation. And I'm certainly going to be sending this section of the show to my mum, who still, after all these years, you know, needs to hear this from a doctor, you know, not just me kind of puffing back and going, nah, mum, it's good for me. Yeah, bro, come on. (laughs) (laughs) So let's dive a little bit deeper into cannabis as a medicine then seeing as that is uh, your specialty and, and your area of passion what is the endocannabinoid system yeah paul it's it's a it's a rudimentary system that most living things have um and it really is a homeostasis system that controls things makes things run more efficiently it has its action at the at the nerve end plate where the signal transfers to the next nerve. And that's done through our own endocannabinoids. You know, our body makes cannabinoids and cannabis compounds, really. And those plug into receptors to cause a, you know, intracellular change. Um, And that's for the better. Um, You know, there's a lot of examples. And for instance, it's like a thermostat or a dimmer on a light. It just makes things a little bit clearer a little bit better if that signal's running faster, it slows it down. If that signal's slow, then it speeds it up. And, the, and there's many conditions that it can help. And it plugs into the central nervous system and, and also our immune systems. So most of 
what we're doing is making things run more efficiently. And it has its hand in, you know, sleep, digestion, pain, uh, mental health conditions. So it's, it's, it's quite involved in every system that we have. And, you know, most living things have it. And no wonder the phytocannabinoids work because our own bodies produce cannabinoids that have a great function. So we're able to augment that with plant medicine. So correct me if I'm wrong, in a way, our bodies are designed to receive cannabis in a sense. Absolutely. Absolutely it is. You mentioned the word homeostasis. You're now my fourth guest and three out of four guests have mentioned this word. And to many Australian people, that would be a new new phrase and a new expression, but it really is just about achieving balance. I think so many people think about cannabis as getting high and that elevation being high, but if I feel low, it lifts me up to normal. If I'm feeling escalated or stressed, it can calm me down, return me to that balance. And that's what it's all about. You know, we're, we're not trying to get people messed up. We're not trying to get people stoned. We're really trying to treat symptoms, improve quality of life and, and help patients get by a little bit better, you know? I think there are some typical conditions people are familiar with. You know, cannabis is useful for insomnia. Uh, It's helpful for mental health challenges. It's helpful for pain management. What are some of the types of conditions you're treating people for? Yeah, I mean, mostly it's it's chronic pain, um, you know, non-cancer pain, cancer pain. um, And those are broken down into, you know, more specifically like your arthritic pain, your autoimmune type pain, your neuropathic and, you know, your cancer pains. And then you go into, you know, your um, mental health diagnoses with PTSD, resistant anxiety, depression. It's very helpful with insomnia. You know, I've got patients all over the spectrum, to be honest, Paul. You know, it's, um, you know, it's it's helpful for MS. Um, it can be helpful for Parkinson's. I've, I've treated, you know, patients with those um, real rigid movements and, and strict movements and, and stiffness and um, you know, it helps with the tremor. And each month that goes by, you know, the TGA is allowing us to use a little bit, you know, more indications uh, with this medicine. So the, those real, that group that I just spoke about is what we mostly treat, you know, you, and, and there's subsets within those like, you know, fibromyalgia pain, which is, um, you know, one that some clinicians over the years haven't, haven't really been supportive of just based on lack of evidence, because we get hammered into our brains and and into our training that evidence-based medicine is what we need to be practicing and you know we're we're pretty um used to doing that so uh there's other conditions like migraine disorder and um and many others inflammatory bowel disease you know huntington's korea gosh man the list goes on i've I've treated most of the conditions in the tga I've, i've treated thousands of patients over the last four years so Yeah, it's been quite fun. That's amazing. Thousands of patients with thousands of different experiences. Are there many medications that work like that, that are so broadly applicable? Is there really even anything else out there like that? There's not a single one, buddy. I mean, you, you can, um, you can hit multiple indications with one medicine and, and potentially decrease the polypharmacy, which is extremely valuable for people. And, you know, um, there's no medicine that I know of that can do that, that, you know, you treat um, irritable bowel syndrome. And for instance, patients come back to me and say, my psoriasis is better. How did that happen? Like I've started to, you know, to sleep, I have good sleep patterns. Um, You know, just just goes on and on all these little things that you never really intended to treat, but it, it potentially you know, hit the nail on the head with that one as well. I know a lot of people face challenges with the responses or the retorts they get from certain medical practitioners about this field of medicine. What's it like being a GP and being a doctor in this field? Like, what is it like? What kind of things do you deal with from your peers and the criticisms and the challenges within the the field itself? Well, look, I mean, I live in a pretty supportive community, um, you know, down in the southwest of WA. It's it's pretty cannabis friendly, to be honest, you know, quite a big surfing community. So I don't get really any um, any of that feedback, to be honest. I mean, most of what we get is from, you know, specialists, um, specialists in Perth, specialists around the nation, and, and certainly those more conservative patients and older patients that certainly have, have formed their opinion long ago about cannabis. But um, yeah, look, I take it as an oppor- a real opportunity to educate. I mean, it, it's it's amazing, you know, that some patients don't even know that, that cannabis is, is 
um, you're they're able to access it. Specialists like you know your your pain specialists and the pain specialty colleges don't recognize it um, because of the lack of evidence. But you know those those research studies are compiling now, and you know recently there's been a lot of data, for instance, on chronic pain uh, and patients getting off their benzodiazepines and and their opiates. So there's real value there. And over time, I think with good results, good patient stories, education, like some of us are trying to do on, you know, Instagram and, and things like that about, you know, plant medicine and the proper way to do it and, you know, educating it, why it works and exactly the ECS and, you know, what, what each of us have in, in, inside that, that help us with uh, the phytocannabinoids. So it's challenging, certainly, and one was I, I was very concerned about that at first because of the the work that I'd done for our reputation. You know, doctors are are obviously concerned about that, um, and I still am. But I'm just so happy with the results that I've had with my patients. That's not a concern for me anymore. A common thread with all my guests so far has been an, an element of risk taking being necessary. If you are going to operate in this space, you do have to put yourself out there because you're going to be at risk of criticism from professionals, from patients, from peers, from family members and things like that. So it definitely takes a bit of a roll of the dice, but the implications for that are different. You know, I had a great guest on Adolfo Gonzalez, who uh, you know is an expert in genetics, who moved from Mexico where friends of his had been murdered for selling hash. You know, you compare those kind of risks to an Australian, you know, you can carry an ounce on you and basically get a slap on the wrist. So we see that the risks vary, but we're all still taking them to an extent. And I think it's really impressive for people to hear from a doctor that it's kind of gone, you know, I was scared of those risks. I was scared of the criticism, but ultimately it's going pretty well. Absolutely. It is. And, and, you know, when patients come back happy and, and it's life-changing for them, uh, like literally life-changing that, I just can't see the the harm in that, the wrong in that at all, you know, and those stories need to get out for those people that really object to it because of the bias. They don't have any experience. And, you know, my encouragement to other physicians is just to give it a go. My gosh, you know, there's, there's really hardly a risk. And if you, if you do things the right way, if you keep in touch with your patient, if you see them, you follow up, you manage it appropriately. Um, touch base with them, make sure that they know you care about them. The risk is much less. And if there is any problems, then communicate and, you know, rectify it together. We seem to so often hear that there's limited research. We still don't have the data. Is this a true argument or is this somewhat of a nefarious blockade to getting the information out there? Like at what point do we get to a stage where lawmakers are happy with the evidence we've got, the police are happy, politicians are happy? I, I think it's a little bit of both, to be honest. I mean, you, you know, we we don't have enough research to, to convince everybody appropriately, but we're working on it. And I think it's going to take a couple of years, you know, from now until we get some some research to where things open up a little bit more. And, uh, you know, I encourage those clinics and those doctors and people out there that really do care about plant medicine to, to do those things because it advances the space, makes things better for everyone else later on. But I think, I think we're a couple of years away, but it, it is something that we hear, we continue to hear. Um, and, and that's rooted in bias, you know, because there, there is data, there is data about, you know, patients, in you know the states in California coming off of their benzodiazepines the ability for patients to come off of their opiates without the withdrawal and in use of THC you know suicide rates have decreased in California when legalization happened like that's huge that's those are lives though what's more valuable than a life so you know that 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 if that's not convincing Gosh, man, I, I don't know, like the risk and harm reduction of cannabis versus those other medications. It's a no brainer to me. And, and that's the real value in it is getting patients off multiple other drugs, the polypharmacy issue, um, the dependency, the toxicity with cannabis. It's just not there. Speaking of saving lives, it actually prompts me for one of our listener questions. This is from Phil. Myth or fact, cannabis cannot kill you. Um. I, I think it's fact. I mean, I think you'd probably fall asleep much quicker than <laughs> than um, anything else. Like you're, I think it's twenty thousand doses 
is the is the lethal wow. <laughs> twenty thousand, and whereas with heroin it's eight or four, something like that. So big difference there. You're never going to reach twenty thousand. So I, I think you know I think it's false. I think it's really important that we start to get the truth out there. And I do think it's interesting that there's so many questions about where's the research, yet really flawed and imperfect research kind of formed the basis of prohibition to an extent. Like I remember seeing a study that Nixon kind of commissioned where basically cannabis can kill you and they'd been ultimately putting gas masks on monkeys and suffocating them with the smoke, but using that data to say that that's the cannabis killing you. Yeah, that, that was actually hypoxia or lack of oxygen to the brain. I mean, that, <laughs> that's ridiculous. It seems like a lot of effort and energy is going into kind of reframing cannabis and giving the data, but we are definitely working against very old school rules and laws. The Driving Act is one in Australia, for example, that's discriminating against patients. And I think Australia is still very much informed by the US. And that's really why I have you on today because of that US and Australia connection. Sure. I want to talk a little bit more about Australia's approach to medical cannabis versus the US. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit more about Joe Biden and what he's done recently sure. with federal cannabis legalization. But before that, I want to see how well you've integrated into Australia over your last 10 years. And oh, the I'm wondering pressure's if, on. <laughs> I'm wondering if you might be up for a little rapid fire quiz. What do you Absolutely. reckon? Absolutely. Let's do it, brother. Awesome. Well, the purpose of this is on previous episodes, I've had more recreational cannabis users where I ask them questions about their use. This is about America and Australia and how well you've integrated. So I'm going to give you an American expression, and you have to tell me what the Australian translation. So, for example, if I were to say flip-flops, the answer would be? Dongs. If I were to say trunk, like in your car, the answer would be? Boot. Boot. There you go. You've even got the accent down. So, let's get this tick and clock going and see how well you've integrated. Oh, man. Bell pepper. Capsicum. Fall, like the season. Autumn. Bathroom. Dunny. Ah, uh, yes, I would have also accepted shit up. <laughs> Guy. Bloke. Oh, amazing. Fanny pack. Ah, oh, sh I don't know, dude. Bum bag for fanny pack. Oh. <laughs> Drapes. Drapes? Um. Drapes, like hanging from your window. Ah, uh, no, don't know. Curtains. Oh, duvet. Drapes. I thought you said grapes. Oh, uh, sorry. Duvet. Uh, is it done? It's not Dunny, is it? No, it's... Uh, it's very close. Duna. Sweater. I'm putting my sweater on. Jumper. Liquor store. Oh, um, bottle of... You got it. And lucky last, cooler. Oh, Esky. <laughs> oh, mate, I think you're doing really well. The only ones you messed up were my bad pronunciation, my mumbling. So I think you've done a fantastic job there. Hey, thanks, dude. I've assimilated. That's good. <laughs> I send that to the government. I say that you're an approved Australian. Sweet. <laughs> I got a good grade. Let me stay. <laughs> we'll keep you. We'll keep you for sure. Well, moving forward into kind of the relationship with the USA and Australia, you know, we have a lot of pop culture connections right behind me. You can see a bunch of Boston Celtics jerseys. You know, it's, I love it. it's kind of hard to not have that influence here on our massive island with a small population. What really grabbed my attention is I heard you on the Alt Med podcast, another great cannabis podcast, where you really changed my mind about the effectiveness of the Australian medical system. Many people are familiar that the U.S. has various degrees of legalization state to state. And in many medical states, you go to a doctor, you get a card, then you can go to the dispensary and choose generally at will. In Australia, it's a lot more refined than that. You're prescribed certain products, you review those products, and you continue to have an ongoing relationship with your doctor. As someone who is experienced with cannabis on a personal level, mm -hmm. I would have loved that medical card aspect where I can just go and choose the things that work for me. Sure. But I understand that the way Australia is doing it is probably helping us collect that data that we're so desperate to get. So Absolutely. talk to us a little bit about why Australia is kind of getting it right in that regard. Well, look, I mean, having a card, you know, that was the extent of, of management um, of those patients in in the states, and so they're they're able to 
to go do what, what they what they want. And that, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, they're they're accessing it for medicinal purposes and, and lack of management isn't a good medicine. So I think that's different. And, and two, it allows us here to get the data needed to um, to prove that these indications can be treated with with cannabis. And so that that I think the system is much better here because it's it's doing things um, in the right way for the long term. There's no there's you know there's no opportunity for cowboys to to come in and and do the wrong thing. I think it's it's yes it's slow it's frustrating you know certainly for someone who's got the experience of a recreational market like yourself it, it's it can be really frustrating um, and. I understand that, but I think from a medical perspective and from data capture and and getting all the stuff that we need in order to, for the TGA to to deem it a um, not a schedule eight, but to down schedule it and be accessible through the PBS. Uh, we're a long way from there, but that's I think that's really why why they're doing things that way. So, you know, we are going about a lot of research right now all throughout Australia. And I think that's a wonderful thing because then then we can change the minds of those physicians that are dead set in that bias. And that that's important. Are we there yet? No. But I think, you know, a couple of years, we can definitely have more confidence in, in cannabis as a medicine. I certainly appreciate someone like you acknowledging that people can have an expertise or an experience with cannabis that informs their use. However, as a PSA, I would like to kind of put it out there to the listener that one of the more pervasive things in cannabis is the kind of know-it-all aspect of certain users. So even someone like me who knows pretty well what works for me, it's still important that we shut up and listen because ultimately there are a bunch of dudes like me out there who think they know what's best. And I certainly make sure that when my doctor's speaking, when my nurse practitioner is speaking, I shut up and listen. Well, there, and also, and vice versa, buddy, it's, it's equally as important for us to shut up and listen because we don't know everything either. Like, we don't. And that therapeutic relationship is strengthened by listening. And that's so important that we we listen to our patients. Yes, we encounter, you know, rec users every day who do know a lot. And yes, I think it's it's very important that we we be quiet and listen. And because, you know, you never know what, what you can pick up from somebody and checking your ego is a good thing. And I think that is a challenge for a lot of people. And I think it's particularly a challenge for doctors. I think most people listening, hearing you say that, where the doctor's going to do more listening, that is kind of the new wave of general practitioner. And I've been very lucky to have very understanding GPs over the years. But I do think back to the early days when I was a kid and we had that family doctor and it was what the doctor said went, you don't question anything, you just take the medicine, oh, it's not working, you double the dose. And it is very refreshing to hear your perspective and your encouragement that it's a symbiotic relationship and the conversation goes both ways. Both ways, buddy. That's that's what's going to help your patients the best. You mentioned that we're still a while off getting this on the PBS. What do you think are the steps to take to get to that point? Do you think we'll get to that point? Man, it's hard. It's hard to be really positive on that answer, whether or not the data that we get in the next few years is going to convince them to rebate um, the medicine. I don't know. I think we're a long way off from there. Um, we've got, we've got some, you know, some old school dinosaurs uh, up in the, you know, the management levels there that, that are pretty stuck in on their biases. So I don't see that happening um, soon. Uh, and hopefully it will, but gosh, you know, we've got, we've got a lot of work to do. I'm curious as to whether a potential recreational adult use market might even begin to supplement people's medical use. You know, I was thinking about that on the way um, today to talk to you. It, you know, I think that's a that's a very real potential where they they flip it and and you know they work side by side. You know, the rec and, and medicinal. I, I don't know. It's 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 hard to predict the future. It's hard to predict when. You know, the boys at AltMed they always ask folks that they they talk to you know i think it's one of their last questions and it's hard to hard to really predict that one but i would say in the next five to ten you know but i think really i think the argument for decriminalization first is extremely important and good on joe biden i think he's done a really a good thing by pardoning people getting people out of jail reducing all the 
just wasted resources on those folks for possession and probably many of them, you know, doing the right thing for themselves for some kind of a condition. I think it's de decriminalization is, is what we need to be focusing on um, because that's that's really important. It's we shouldn't be spending billions of dollars incarcerating people for cannabis. We just shouldn't. Do you think Joe Biden's decision to federally decriminalize cannabis, issue pardons to people with low level fines and charges, do you think that will force Australia's hand or the rest of the world? Do they have that kind of influence to make us reevaluate what we're doing? I don't know if, if you know it forces a hand, but it certainly opens some eyes and opens some mouths to talk about the, the issue for sure. Circling back to Australian medical cannabis, obviously things have changed a lot since legalization in 2016 and the access has increased. What are some of the really positive things that are kind of moving at the moment? And what are the changes you're expecting to see in the near future? Well, I'd certainly love to see, there's two issues that I, you know, I'd love to see um, a spotlight shown on and really change. And that, that's, is, is the driving laws. I think that's, that's got to change. It's discriminatory. You know, you've got patients that are doing the right thing, but can potentially get in trouble for it. So we've got to get rid of that disconnect there. Um, and two, uh, another issue that I'm pretty passionate about is getting um, mental health diagnoses acceptable for mental for medicinal cannabis treatment for our veterans. You know, they can they can get medicinal cannabis for chronic pain and other conditions, but the DVA committee is saying that there's not enough evidence for mental health. And I, I get it. I think they're trying to protect their veterans, but their vets are, are accessing cannabis successfully already, you know, on the black market. And um, furthermore, there's a lot of really good data in, in the, the Department of Veteran Affairs and, and the states in regards to cannabis use and, and polypharmacy and things like that. So those, those two issues, I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to get involved with myself, obviously, and shine a light on and try to get that changed because I think those are, are really important. I mean, the discrimination is real, you know, and the lack of evidence excuse is bullshit. And the excuses do pile up. It was only yesterday that New South Wales voted down a potential change in the driving bill. It was voted down 29 to 6, which is an emphatic denial of what is ultimately a good idea. Medical cannabis patients are being discriminated against. For those who aren't aware, the drug driving laws say that if you have cannabis in your system, THC in your system, that by default, you are going to lose your license. There's no room for impairment or not. It's just a baseline. In your system, you're screwed. And it's really quite unfortunate. And I actually contacted one of the Labor MLAs who voted it down, someone who's very passionate about cannabis. And the only explanation I got was that they'd already told the Greens that they weren't going to vote yes for it. Not why, not the reasoning, not the research, just that they'd already told them they weren't going to vote. And they just voted as a collective and voted down good ideas. And this is where it's so important for people to put pressure on their representatives, because that is someone I've spoken to for years as an advocate, as someone I see as an ally. And here we are in 2022 when things are better than ever and they're making poor excuses. You have to wonder what he got for that. You know, it's it's politics, man. Politics is dirty. He'd have to have received something, some kind of a benefit for that decision. And that says that he's not listening to his his population that he's representing. And that's a damn, that's a damn shame because he was voted and he should get voted out. And it's really unfortunately changed my mind about someone who, you know, I did think was on our side. You know, there's people who are willing to put the, their reputation on the line. There's people like Fiona Patton yeah. who understand that this is bigger than her, you know, that she needs to put these ideas out there. And even if it's going to bring criticism, you need to still keep going forward. Anyone who's watched Utopia or Veep would understand what a shit show politics could be and the kind of compromises that are made. And I think I realize that as I get older and the more political that I get, I've always been passionate about politics, but now I'm in my thirties. I see how many things truly affect me. Not much policy really affects 20 year olds. You're having a good time, you're enjoying life and you get to your thirties and you're like, well, I want better access to things that improve my life. I want my community to be better. I want my politicians to make sensible decisions. So if anyone's out there listening and they're in their 30s and they're starting to get frustrated like I am, please write to your MPs, write to your MLAs and put the pressure on. Let them know you care. Yeah, Paul, the easy thing to do, my friend, is be apathetic and say, oh, F it. 
you know, I'm, you know, I got no, I got no influence with my vote. Well, that's not, not true. So now's not the time in your thirties to get apathetic. Now's the time to get active. And it was interesting while I was in Canada and fresh legalization happened. And obviously Canada has an existing cannabis culture that conflicted with the way legalization was introduced, but working as a bud tender, I would have so many people complain about, you know, the excess packaging, the excess tax on the products, the price, the humidity levels and things like that. And the second I would say, right to your MLA, right to your MP, they tune out and be like, ah, oh, yeah, no, that's, um, I can't be bothered doing that. And writing an email does take an hour. Like it, it, writing a good email to your MP takes some time. I've been drafting one for two weeks. It takes time, but it's well worth it. Yeah, man, absolutely. Get involved. So in regards to the high level of regulation and control on cannabis as a pharmaceutical, do you think the roadblocks and regulations will improve? Do you think this is just the early days as they're tiptoeing into how does this thing work? Do you think access will increase? Do you think the regulation will will shrink to an extent? I do. I do. I mean, I think as more and more positive stories come out, as more and more data from research comes out, I think that's a, a logical endpoint. Definitely. It has to. So as we get towards the business end of this conversation, I do really appreciate your time and you've been so eloquent and passionate in your explanations. And I'm so grateful for that. I have a couple of listener questions here that are just a little bit random. True, man. So the first one being, how do you feel about recreational cannabis use? Now, I know you've touched on this to an extent in your own personal relationship. How do you feel about on an island recreational cannabis use? No, I, I think it's it's fine. Like, um, you know, it, it's it's been done this way for years and years and years. There's no way we're going to not stop recreational cannabis use. So I I think there is a proper way to use cannabis, you know, and that's what I'm trying to do. I think using it mindfully, really paying attention to symptoms and using the least amount possible for the greatest benefit, you know, rather than, you know, surpassing that amount, just, just out of habit, really paying attention. I think that's what, that's, what's most important, whether you do that recreationally or, or medicinally. It doesn't matter to me. I think there's just a really good way to improve your quality of life by paying attention. That's fantastic advice. And the next question is, CBN and CBG products are popping up in the Canadian legal market. Are we expecting to see a broader range of cannabinoid medicine in our market down the line? For sure. No question about it. You know, I think our our market will, will mirror probably Canada's more so than America. Um, I think that just government wise, they're watching Canada, they're observing, they're structuring all of the le um, legislation after Canada, I think. So for sure. And, and that's um, there, there is a, a special place for those two cannabinoids um, in all cannabinoids, to be honest, they're all therapeutic. I think terpenes are amazing. They're definitely something that patients don't understand. Uh, or most most folks don't. You know, it's not about THC all the time. You know, you, you can get a low THC product with an amazing terpene profile, and make it more effective than your twenty five percent THC products. So, um, and and that's that's with CBG and CBN too. There's a lot of things, a lot of research going on with those around the world, and uh, that's exciting. It was definitely great to see on one of my products, Medcans SC01, mm. a list of terpenes and a list of cannabinoids. And I even saw CBGA listed on there. And so that's a great progressive step. As you said, many people probably aren't aware of what terpenes are and the full extent of how cannabinoids work. But it's mm. great that we're tiptoeing into that being just something that's on the label that can pique people's interests and get that conversation going. Definitely. And for those who don't know what terpenes are by this point, terpenes are basically the aromatics of cannabis that can impact the effect of them. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, those wonderful smells and, and tastes. Those are the terpenes. And terpenes are found all, all throughout nature. You know, one of my favorite is, is pinene, you know, and you, you got a, a, a whiff of that quite often, my friend, in, in Canada. And mm -hmm. that's honestly my favorite smell on the planet. And there's so many associations with that one. And lo and behold, it's therapeutic. And no wonder I loved it. So yeah, man, terpenes are great. I'm, I'm enjoying uh, educating myself on them. Like I said, I don't know everything, but 
it's been fun to, to delve into that and educate even myself more. I think that's something for consumers to realize as well. So often I talk about the aromatics and different flavor profiles and things like that. And people are like, dude, this just tastes like dirt. And so often in Australia, that is the case. <laughs> oh man. But you know, the exciting thing is, yes, there's a lot, there's a lot of, of products to stay on top of, you know, every week there's a, you know, a new dozen more. Um, but I think that's a great thing because as you dilute the market, prices come down, it's basic economics and, you know, competition and that makes products better. And you know, in a year from now, I think with with the new laws coming in for GMP, you'll you'll see a lot of of probably smaller companies that don't have those processes in place probably drop off, which will concentrate the the products to certain you know companies, um, and I think that can be a, a very good thing. So, yeah, I, th I think there's there's a a progression of of this space that's happening pretty rapidly right now. Well, we've reached the point of the episode where we have a segment called Polls of Wisdom. And this is your opportunity to share a dinner party fact, something snappy and easy that the average person might not know, might need to be a retort at a dinner party when someone says something dumb about cannabis. So what little Paul of Wisdom would you drop on them? You know, I don't, I don't know if I have a huge Paul of Wisdom, but uh, what I would say is I think it's really important for folks that are, that are vaping um, to really take it easy and, you know, in, inhale for a certain amount of time, hold it and exhale and wait. I think waiting is an extremely valuable tool because medicines are expensive. You don't want to be impaired. You know, you want to get that symptom relief with the least amount possible. So I don't know if that's a, a pall of wisdom, but I just would encourage folks to be more mindful and and really respect their medicine and um, hold on because that one breath may be exactly what's going to cause you to have symptom relief instead of powering through and having you know four or five more. Well, who would have known that your pall of wisdom is the same as Seth Rogen and Snoop Dogg's? That's have one puff and wait. Oh, really? I didn't know that. <laughs> yep, your kindred spirits. Well, Dr. Maddie Moore, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show speaking to us today. You are such a wealth of knowledge. And as a medical user, I'm so appreciative of someone like you being so open to this journey and this experience and being there to help people through their cannabis journey. Where can people find you on the internet? Sure, buddy. Well, you can find me on Instagram at, at Dr. Maddie Moore, D R M A W T Y M W O R E. And you can find our clinic at Mode Healthcare at M O D E H E A L T H C A R E. Our website as well is www.modehealthcare.com.au. Have a look, see if you qualify and um, book in because we provide telehealth all across the nation. Really important that you check your indications. Certainly, because there's a couple of boxes that you need to tick for the government. And number one is having the proper indication. And two is trying conventional medicines and failing or having side effects with those. If you have those two ticked boxes, then you are eligible for Mode Healthcare to give it a go and help you improve your quality of life. Those are all great places to find you. I'll put links to those in the show notes below, as well as your great video when you teamed up with Hona Lee to explain the endocannabinoid system in detail. So listeners, you'll find those below in the notes. Dr. Matty Moore, you are a huge asset to our medical cannabis community. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks so much, Paul. It's been a blast, buddy. Good luck. Given Tote Cannabis Conversations is written and produced by me, Paul. Music written and produced by Big Mike. Follow us on Instagram at Give and Toke or get in touch by emailing giveandtoke at gmail.com. You'll also find us on Twitter and Facebook. All opinions expressed by program guests are solely their current opinions and do not necessarily reflect the position of Give and Toke. Content discussed in this show does not constitute medical advice. Cannabis is not legal everywhere, so please be aware of local laws. 